Terminal ballistics. That's all things about how a bullet performs in its target. Now some shooters are familiar with, or most shooters are probably familiar with, energy, muzzle energy, expressed normally in foot-pounds of energy. And you know, that is probably just as good as any of these measures of terminal performance, as we're going to see. But there are many other ways of quantifying terminal performance, such as relative stopping power, relative incapacitation index, penetration indices, forward momentum, and wound mass, as well as maximum penetration developed by Charles Schwartz in the quantitative ammunition selection. You know, a couple of years ago, had some nice conversations with Charles Schwartz. Good guy and a good book, certainly worth reading. What is really interesting is there is a lot of forensic ballistic or terminal ballistics literature that really stresses the size of the bullet as a primary indicator of its lethality, such as a bullet's frontal area, literally the square inches of that bullet's frontal area, the ratio of its expanded size to its retained length, the Thor penetration index, as well as wound mass that we already talked about. In each of the examples that I just noted, a 230 grain 45 ACP bullet is considered to have more lethality or be more lethal than a 165 grain 308 Winchester rifle bullet. To be fair, not all of those indices or measures or estimates give the advantage to the handgun bullet. Uh, in fact, the energy, uh, muzzle energy calculation I talked about at the early part of this video, certainly gives the advantage to a rifle bullet. But a problem arises from the fact that most forensic balli uh, ballistics literature focuses on wounds caused by handguns, and it simply ignores the effect of the temporary wound channel, or the transient cavitation channel, saying that lethality is caused by the crushing and tearing effect of a bullet, and the temporary wound channel has little or no effect whatsoever on lethality. But you see, handgun bullets do not produce the same type of wound as does a rifle bullet. In fact, the handgun bullets tend to produce rather tiny or fairly small temporary wound channels compared to the rifle bullets. And for that reason, it's pretty fair to ignore that part of the big picture. Now, the temporary wound channel effect I'm alluding to is that kind of obvious dramatic effect as we watch the ballistic gelatin and we see so often, and I've done those tests uh, as well with various different bullets, but we see that very dramatic ballooning effect, very short term, but uh, that very dramatic ballooning effect in that ballistic gelatin. That temporary wound channel is caused by the very rapid change in pressure around surrounding the path of that bullet. That pressure is very transient, however. In other words, it doesn't last long. And that's why it's sometimes called, and sometimes I refer to it as the transient cavitation channel. Nonetheless, its effect is very real. I bet all of you are actually already familiar with this effect. Have you ever been walking down a side of a highway, interstate highway, and a large semi is approaching you? And as it passes, you can literally feel being pushed. Now, the, the semi didn't hit you, not even close. You were probably numerous meters away from it, yet you felt the push of that wave of air um, as it impacted you as that semi passed you by. Some of you may have heard or read, or maybe some of you experienced, uh, incoming artillery attacks. You read about 
these accounts and how people, soldiers are knocked to the ground, yet they're never touched by anything tangible. They're never wounded by it. They're simply pushed to the ground, lifted off the ground. Material is lifted off the ground with these close, high-energy uh, artillery impacts. Or maybe you've heard about, surely you have, heard about the sonic boom created by a supersonic jet and how sometimes, if it's flying low enough, uh, that boom will break windows in uh, glass windows in uh, homes and offices. This effect is actually called overpressure or blast overpressure and it moves very, very quickly and it lasts for a very short period of time. Blast overpressure is formed because the pressures being created by that bullet or by that artillery round or by that jet exceeding the sound, the speed of sound, that the pressures created there greatly exceed the normal atmospheric pressure surrounding it and in effect the air is being bunched up or piled up causing a wave-like effect, a shock wave type of effect. And that shock wave is a function of the speed of sound. Now as we just saw, blast over pressure can affect a person externally but it can also affect a person internally as well. But here we have to understand that the medium outside the body is very different than the medium inside the body. The speed of sound in the atmosphere, which is a gas, is effectively 1,100 feet per second at this altitude that I'm sitting at right now. But the speed of sound changes based on the medium in which that sound wave is passing through. For instance, sound waves passing through water are much faster, about 4,900 feet per second. So now we get the idea that, well, the human body or an animal's body um, is, we've heard, composed of a lot of water, a lot of liquid. We might think that um, well, I don't know how a bullet is going to um, impact the body with blast overpressure because no bullet is traveling at 4,900 feet per second. But you see, the human body is not water either. Certainly not a bag full of air, and it's certainly not a bag full of H2O. Now, are you with me? Maybe you're already thinking ahead of me. So what is the speed of sound inside the body? Well, to answer that question, we have to use what's called bulk modulus and density to determine the speed of sound inside the body. Now, lucky for us, we don't have to make that calculation because other research scientists have already done that. And all we need to do is look up those values bulk modulus for different organs and different tissues, as well as the density of those tissues. And from that point, we can calculate the speed of sound in that medium. So using the average or mean mo bulk modulus and mean density of soft tissues in the body, we find that the speed of sound in the body is about 1,900 feet per second. Thus, to see a tangible effect of blast overpressure inside the body, the bullet needs to be traveling in excess of 1,900 feet per second. That's why the uh, early forensic uh, scientists never saw an effect due to handgun rounds, and still today, will not see a blast over pressure effect inside the body due to handgun rounds. Handguns tend to run at a velocity of about 1100, 1200. There are some screamers out there, but none come close to 1900 feet per second. We have to be dealing with a rifle round to see that sort of effect. And now we can bring this all together and calculate the pounds per square inch of force impacting the body. For example, 
that 9 millimeter 124 grain bullet traveling at 1,200 feet per second at the muzzle produces 33 pounds per square inch of, uh, of force. In comparison, my favorite deer hunting rifle, 7 millimeter Remington Magnum, fires a 160 grain bullet traveling at slightly over 3,200 feet per second. This produces over 300 pounds per square inch. The take home message is clear. Fast moving bullets are far more lethal. That's why we use rifles when we're out hunting big game. That's why militaries around the world use rifles. And that's why today a lot of citizens are choosing rifles for their home defense weapon. Second, it's important to understand that there is an additional effect of rifle bullets or any round that is exceeding the speed of sound inside the body, inside the target, that doesn't even exist with slower moving handgun rounds or slower moving bullets. And while this was largely ignored by the forensic ballistics literature in the past, I am seeing recently some talk about looking more closely, examining more closely the effect of that temporary wound channel. For many of us, we can chalk all this up to just better understanding guns and firearms and how all this works, especially if you're a hunter or if you're interested in personal protection. Hey, I hope you learned something today and I hope you enjoyed this video. Take care. Thanks for watching.